Jinji is a world-class athlete and Dan as a world leader. Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Prime Minister, it's great to see you, great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Now, I began with this somewhat verbose introduction, first because I know of your interest in Sufism and more importantly, because I think your whole life in politics and before that is a very colorful and I think very authentic illustration of following your heart's desires, which was very central to Rumi's teachings and the teachings of other uh, mystics. You're going to turn 70 this year. What keeps you powered? Well, let me say one thing. Um, when, a, when a human is born, uh, Within him, he's trying to look for God. And this is a constant journey towards God. A lot of people, unfortunately, never ask the two questions. They never ask themselves, what is the purpose of existence? And what happens to me after I die? Mm. But whenever they ask these questions, it takes them towards God. The only way you can have the quest, uh, answer to this question the purpose of ex existence, what happens to us when we die, is in religion. And all religions answer that. For me, if you are on the spiritual uh, road, then you will always be looking for how you can uh, face your God after you die, that you have fulfilled your responsibility and ability as a human being. And our responsibility as, as a human being is the more God gives us, the more responsibility we have to lift, to help other human beings. Well, let's talk about this practical aspect of our lives, uh, helping other human beings and the state of the world, which uh, there are a lot of concerns uh, around the world about where it's moving, uh, many apocalyptic projections. Uh, I wonder how you feel about it and how do you feel about Pakistan's ability to adapt to this shifting landscape? Well, the world faces two huge challenges. One is climate change, where uh, the material existence, when we only live in this world for material well-being, then the classic example is how we um, imperil our own existence. existence. When we only live in this world for material well-being, then the classic example is how we um, imperil our own existence is what climate change is, how we have ravaged uh, the, the, the earth and how we have misused the blessings of God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so, so that is the biggest challenge, I think, for human beings. The second biggest challenge is the plunder of the developing world by the ruling elites of the developing world, where every year huge amounts of money according to the factile channel uh, of the Secretary General of the UN, $1.5 trillion move from illegally. There's a trade imbalance anyway. I mean, the, trade, the money flows through the trade imbalance to the developed world anyway. But the illicit, the illegal money laundered by the ruling elites, uh, over $1.5 trillion every year moves to the offshore accounts and Western capitals. Now, this is going to have severe consequences on food, on hunger, on starvation, on, on imbalance between the rich and the poor. And so I don't think enough attention is being paid to the second one mm -hmm. because the, the richer countries benefit from it because they have this capital inflow, so they don't care. But, but the poor countries are getting destroyed. Now, I, I mentioned uh, Rumi, and he wrote something to the effect that clever people want to change the world, while wise people focus on themselves. And I wonder if the current predicament, including the ones that you talked about, climate change and uh, the plundering uh, of, um, of the human societies. Of the, of the poor countries. Yeah. Uh, if that is, in a way, a consequence of some clever people trying to make the world a better place. The plunder is simple. The rich people in the, uh, the ruling elites, what they do is, uh, when they, as prime minister and me as a prime minister, if I want to take money out of, from Pakistan and my ministers, the only way I can do it is by destroying the institutions that will stop me from doing it. The judiciary, the accountability process, the, 
the tax department. So when I destroy the institutions, the country goes down. And this is why countries are poor. But what is happening is the rich countries are now building barriers. They are allowing the capital to come in, but they don't allow the labor to come in. So the only way uh, to stop this people dying of hunger and poverty and this imbalance is for the rich countries to make laws like they have for drug money, like they have for terror financing. They should not allow, for instance, our ex-rulers have living in millions of dollars of properties in London. We can't do anything to get them back because the rich countries, they make it so difficult to get, let us get the money back. This should change because if really you want to stop this immigrant problem, poverty in the developing world, then there has to be a way that if, for instance, we say that, look, this person who was living in Pakistan has these huge properties in London, then, then unless that person can justify that he got this money legally, the property should be returned to us. That would stop the plunder of the developing world. We are recording this interview uh, on the eve of your visit to Russia uh, for a, a highly anticipated meeting between the heads of uh, our countries. Uh, countries uh, whose relationship for a very long time has been conditioned on others. It's been a function of, uh, you know, other processes, regional, global processes. Do you think uh, Russia and Pakistan have reached that point when they can deal with one another as, you know, self-sufficient actors on a bilateral basis rather than, let's say, looking onto others? Well, uh, let me just go back in history. Uh, when the Cold War was, uh, you know, ravaging the whole of the the world, the world was divided into blocks. Pakistan moved in with the United States. We became part of the bloc in the Cold War with the US. India actually stayed neutral, but it was very close to the Soviets. Uh, now when I look back, I think initially Pakistan needed help because uh, when we became independent, we were impoverished. There were millions of refugees in Pakistan. We needed help. But, you know, beyond uh, 10 years or so, we should have then uh, been non-aligned, independent country, uh, stood on our own feet, not relied on aid. We became part of a bloc because we got foreign aid. When you look back, foreign aid is a curse for a country because you do not fix your own systems. You do not raise your own nev revenues. You don't increase your exports. You rely on handouts and it stops a country evolving and developing and becoming self-reliant. So the, the world being divided into Cold War blocks and Pakistan becoming part of a bloc, when you look back, uh, it stopped us from developing as a country. Well, you cannot go back, but you can change things moving forward. So do so, you think at this so, point... So when you, but you, you, know, you learn from history. You learn from your mistakes. Uh, you ha have to know how to take the knocks. I, I guess that's your <laughs> motto in life, right? You cannot uh, move forward in life until you learn from your mistakes. So now what we want to do is not become part of any bloc. We want to have trading relationships with all countries. We have suffered. Uh, India uh, became a hostile country, so the trade between them was minimal. Iran had sanctions, so we couldn't trade on the west side. Afghanistan has 40 years of conflict, so we couldn't go north and then to Central Asia. And we couldn't go to Central Asia because we became part of the U.S. bloc and Central Asia was part of the, uh, the Soviet bloc. So what we want now is trade with everyone. Uh, and, 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 to, and what is the purpose behind it? To raise our people out of poverty. That is the main, any head of state, his main uh, focus should be, how do you raise people out, out of poverty? And, if you, and the best way is trading with everyone. But, uh, Prime Minister, intention to trade is uh, perhaps not enough because, uh, as you know, our countries for quite some time have been discussing a large infrastructure project uh, I think it's called the Pakistan Stream, uh, a gas pipeline. But uh, forgive me my pun, uh, uh, pun the, the stream hasn't gotten enough steam yet. And now in addition to logistical financing challenges, uh, we are also dealing, I mean, Moscow is dealing with a 
threat of arbitrary sanctions, Western sanctions, uh, that could be imposed on any uh, Russia-associated project. Do you think this project and others uh, will be up and running in our lifetime? Because uh, sure, you are free, uh, technically speaking, you are free to trade with everyone, but you know how geopolitics works, and there are some subtle ways of uh, imposing pressure on international partners. That's true. I mean, uh, this uh, North-South Pipeline, one of the reasons it suffered was the companies that, uh, that we were negotiating with turned out that the U.S. had applied sanctions on them. So, so the problem was uh, to get a company that wasn't sanctioned, a, a Russian company that wasn't sanctioned. So that became a problem. Uh, with Iran, we, we, could, uh, we are gas deficient right now. We could just uh, uh, get a, pi a, a gas pipeline from Iran. But Iran is sanctioned. So we, I mean, this is a, I have to say that the developing world really uh, wishes that there is not another Cold War. Because, you know, how do we go ahead? Our purpose is not that we become part of any bloc. Our, my main purpose is we have almost half our population, which is above the uh, half, the bottom 50%, half is above poverty line, and half is below. But if there, if, if there is a, like this commodity super cycle when commodity prices have gone up, or if there's a shock like the, uh, the, the COVID-19, then they start going below the poverty line. So the last thing we want is the world divided into blocks, sanctions, um, and, and I'm hoping that uh, this U Ukraine crisis is resolved uh, peacefully. Mm -hmm. If we read reports in Western media, uh, there is an imminent war between Russia and Ukraine on the cards, uh, and uh, clearly Western countries take a very oppositional, I would even say uh, inimical view to Russia. For a shrewd politician like yourself, don't you think that it's perhaps too precarious of a time to expand Pakistan's geopolitical horizons? Well, firstly, this doesn't concern us. I mean, you know, we have a bilateral relationship with Russia, and uh, we, we, are, we really want to strengthen it. Um, you know, as I said, regions develop. It's not countries don't develop in isolation. It's because a whole region uh, goes up. Like we saw the European Union. I mean, I was in university in England when the European Union uh, came into being, and then the whole area standard of living went up. So we want to sort of really, we hope that, you know, sanctions are lifted on Iran so that, you know, we, we're short of gas here. And, you know, with Iran, it's the cheapest gas we can get. And similarly, we hope that India one day, I mean, Indian leadership, I wish they would concentrate on raising people out of poverty in India rather than proving to the world that the Hindus are the most superior race. I mean, they, they, their leadership, how can a, a leadership not worry about having the most, the, the highest poverty in the world is in the Indian subcontinent? How could they not worry about it rather than trying to prove to the world that the Hindus are superior? Well, so, but the Prime Minister, on the other hand, uh, many nations go through such period. I mean, it could be a... a uh, more or less painful uh, historically, but uh, you know the the spell of nationalism uh, has affected many uh, countries historically. Now uh, you mentioned that you don't want to uh, play camp politics anymore. You want to be a bridge, and uh, this is a very admirable goal. Uh, also, a very beautiful metaphor. I think Turkey or even Ukraine uh, framed their foreign policy in such terms uh, a few years back, but they were disappointed. What makes you believe that Pakistan can actually pull? it off, being this bridge, let's say in Eurasia, when so many other countries attempted it and failed? Well, firstly, l let me just say one thing. As a student of history, I do not believe that military conflicts solve problems. If you look back, I mean, look at the conflict since 9-11, I mean, if a, a third party dispassionately did a proper analysis of so many people killed, what was the what was achieved at the end? What what have not studied history properly? Do you believe, uh, on a personal or let's say on a political level, 
in some sense of accountability, maybe historical accountability, do you think things will change in the world so that all the great aspirations that you have uh, could be uh, realized without uh, us getting very cynical? Because uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying on an emotional level, but I have covered so many wars and I have seen so many people killed absolutely for nothing that I, I, I simply don't believe that uh, Western leaders care about uh, things like human lives or even development in, de in the developing countries. I'm sorry for saying that. It's true. Uh, most leaders, uh, the, the main concern is to stay in power. So if to stay in power, you know, there's a, what they call is, is a good war, they will, they will, they won't mind loss of you, uh, human lives. Oh, as it's long a collateral as, damage, it's not, it's not people, it's collateral damage. Exactly, damages. I mean, uh, you know, as someone who looks upon the world from a spiritual point of view, I think it is insane to have a conflict with the idea of people dying and uh, and thinking that you will get more popular because of that for instance take this ukraine uh, conflict i mean for the life of mine i i cannot really believe that there will they, there is any chance there's any possibility of a conflict because the consequences forget about what will happen to the combatants for the developing world already the price of uh, oil has gone up because of or the prospect of a, of a conflict. Ukraine supplies wheat to the world, uh, and for, for that matter, Russia. Now imagine what will happen. Already the world is suffering from the after effects of the COVID-19. Imagine if there's a conflict. What will happen to the poor countries? Already the poor countries are suffering. They are already in debt because they had to incur debt because of the consequences of the COVID-19 fallout. So I, I, I cannot in my mind understand how will, I mean, how can they even have got this close of, to a conflict? I can't understand this. Prime Minister, we will try to figure it out after a short break, but let's take a, a quick pause for the time being. We'll be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. I'm sure in, in people in Ukraine and in the Russia, everyone understands that if there's a conflict, there will be consequences. Everyone will but be worse. But it's not about the people. People on either side don't want this conflict to happen. So, so, so exactly. But I think that the leadership uh, in, in the countries is then stuck. That if we withdraw from this position, what will be the consequences to us politically? Because politically there are consequences always. And I think it takes very powerful, great leaders who rise above this and who, look, who think about the effects on the human beings. I, I do want to ask you about great leadership, but uh, very quickly, uh, I know that you have tried to deal with your mutual grievances uh, with India over Kashmir, and I'm sure you're not satisfied with the, with the results of those efforts. Um, are you going to leave that issue to your successors, or are you still uh, hoping to try something new? Do you know, when, uh, when my party came into power uh, in 2018, first thing I did was to reach out to India. And I told them, you know, our only issue is Kashmir. Let's sit down on the table and resolve it. Let's have a roadmap. But I didn't realize, you know, and remember, I'm the one who knows India better than anyone because of cricket is a passion, you know, in the subcontinent. And because of, uh, you know, me being captain of cricket here and sort of playing lots of, over 10 years against India. Uh, I know India better than most people. So I immediately reached out. But then I discovered to my horror that this is not the India I used to know because it's been taken over by this mad ideology. It's a racist ideology which was, which was inspired by the Nazis. The founding fathers were inspired by the Nazis. You can Google on your phone and you can uh, the, 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 the founding fathers praised the Nazis, racial superiority. And you see, there's a negative uh, nationalism, there's a positive nationalism. You must distinguish between the two. I can inspire my people by saying, look, you were a great nation, let's now get back again. But if I say you were a great nation, 
but because of these other human communities you could not reach the top so shift the hatred towards them there is always bloodshed prime minister i'm sure your counterpart in new delhi would disagree but if uh, prime minister modi wants to sh share his own views we would be more than uh, happy to travel to new delhi I, and I, interview I, him on listen, that very... listen i would love to debate with narendra modi on tv that would, I would be love great. to talk but you know uh, before we organize this debate and by the way rt would be happy to moderate it me personally but it would be so good for over a billion people on the subcontinent if we can resolve our differences through a debate rather than Friends, through that would be amazing but let me ask specifically about pakistan because this year marks the 75th anniversary of your country coming into being and uh, the the figure of muhammad ali jinnah still looms large with his philosophy of marrying modernity with uh, traditional grassroots culture and i think it's not only in pakistan but i see uh, this philosophy coming to prominence all around the world even in russia i think uh, vladimir putin subscribes to a similar brand of enlightened conservatism when you see uh, progressive things around the world you benefit from them but you stay true to your sort of your inner core your collective soul mm -hmm. why do you think um, it's becoming so popular around the world Why because so be because whenever you try and superimpose another culture on a, on a nation it doesn't work it, you know colonialism what did it do what the colonialists created was a thin lot of people who imitated the colonialists who in pakistan would be called the westernized elite but there was a big gap between them and the rest of the population so uh, nations evolve organically they borrow from all over the world but they they are rooted in their own culture and history if you cut that off i mean it has severe consequences all over the world when you cut off a country from its roots a, a nation and try and ape another culture they become neither one thing or the other in urdu we say neither teeter or bater neither quail or a partridge what has happened after colonialism is that you have a tiny set of elite which pretends that they are that they're western and the gap between them and the rest becomes wider and wider it's what happened in iran the iranian revolution was that the elite of the shah of iran became cut off from the mass of the population so there was a huge reaction against it in pakistan what we are trying to do is to uh, to obviously learn from all advanced societies and right now the 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 nation we can learn most from is china because if my main emphasis is to raise people out of poverty no human society has achieved what china has done so therefore we learn from everyone but we should be rooted in our own culture history religion china played uh, a subtle but uh, i think very significant role in facilitating russian pakistani exchanges and I, i know that recently while visiting beijing you suggested that islamabad can act as a mediator between beijing and uh, washington what makes you believe i'm sorry for being blunt but what makes you believe that mediation is even possible because as far as uh, i understand the american psyche they are not after understanding they are not after negotiating on the level playing field they are after preserving dominance would china agree to that but look the america i know is very diverse any country for instance what is happening in india is not what indians are like this is not the india of uh, of nehru and gandhi this is the india of narendra modi a tiny highly organized elite has taken over india just like the nazis took over germany so you know at a given point there is this extreme nationalism which has been released in the us and they want this dominance but surely there are sensible voices in the us saying that conflict is where you are heading conflict cold war is not the way there is another way where it could be win and win for all all uh, everyone and i certainly believe that the cooperation between china and the united states and even for that matter russia will benefit mankind much more than a conflict mm. i wish i had more time i have many more questions but let me ask the final one um and it's a bit cheesy but i i ask it sincerely because you reached the pinnacle of your sporting career by giving your country its first and only 
victory in the Cricket World Cup. How do you hope to be remembered? What do you want to give to your people as, uh, as the Prime Minister? That's a simple answer. I would love to emulate China in terms of bringing people out of poverty. Two things I want. One thing is if I can bring people out of poverty, but related to that is rule of law. Human societies are defined by two great things, rule of law and a welfare society, a society that is humane and just and looks after its, its uh, uh, people who are not so privileged, who are poor. And so that's how I want to be looked, uh, remembered. If I can bring rule of law in Pakistan and raise our people out of poverty on the lines what China has done, uh, I would be able to meet my maker with confidence. Well, Prime Minister, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. I hope your team receives as much hospitality as we've benefited from here. Best of luck I'm in Moscow and forward. best of luck in Korea. I'm endeavors. looking forward to my trip to Moscow. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Hope to see you again next week on Worlds Apart.